If you're following along in the book, this is chapter two. So we want the camera to follow our player. And our player is only going to do two things. He's either going to be falling because of gravity, or he's going to be jumping because the player is pressing the jump key. And we just want the camera to follow so that the player can see the object he's trying to control. So I'm going to make my flow graph somewhat bigger here. And before I get into this particular code, I want to neaten things up here. I have a sort of section here which deals with just getting the game set up, uh, enabling the camera that we're going to use, disabling the first person shooter player, etc., etc. So I'm going to kind of separate this from the other section, though it is connected by a couple of nodes here. And I'm going to put a separate comment box around this. And I'm just going to call this initial setup. We're going to add quite a bit of stuff to this. I'll end up making this box bigger later. Now I'm going to go to a separate section and try and figure out this problem. So I know I need to move something. So why don't we begin with that? Let's just search for the word move and see what we see. You can probably guess that one of the most likely candidates is this folder, movement. And lo and behold, there are a couple of entities in here that we're going to end up using. One is move and the other one is rotate. So let's take a look at this one. How does this work? Well, of course, we have to tell it what to move. We have to tell it where to move. We have to tell it how fast to move or how long to take to do it. And if it is a speed, we have to tell it meters per second. There are some other parameters in terms of the way it accelerates and deaccelerates. And of course, we actually have to start the movement and we can choose to stop it at some point. So we know what we want to move. It's the camera. So I've got my camera selected. I right click here and assign the selected entity. I need a destination. Well, that destination is constantly changing and it's a position relative to the flappy. So the first question I have to ask myself is, where is the bird? How am I going to get that information? Well, it's going to be something to do with an entity. And if I look under the entity group here, I'll see something called entity position. That looks like it could do the trick as entity and it outputs the position, the rotation and the scaling. That seems like it could work. But I also want to show you another way to do this and talk about the difference between these because it's going to get us into one of the most important concepts in FlowGraph. These both essentially do the same thing. They ask, where is something? But if you look closely, you'll notice that there's one difference in the input nodes, and that's this port right here called get. This implies that nothing happens, the question isn't answered until I trigger this input, get the position of this thing. So if it's a question I only need to ask occasionally, um, hey, where are you? I can manually trigger this. But this node asks that question every single frame of the game. That means it's hitting the computer's resources a lot harder. So I don't want to use this for a question that only needs to be asked sometimes. Well, since my flappy is always moving, he's always either falling or rising, I do need to monitor his position. I don't want to have to worry about triggering this question every single game with a timer. So I'm not going to use get pause in this case, but I will use that node for other kinds of questions later on. Okay, so whose position is it? Well, it's our flappy bird's position. So let's go ahead and assign that. And all we need to do is feed its position to here. So let's think about what we're doing here for a second. What are we really telling FlowGraph to do? Wherever you are, Flappy Bird, move the camera to that same spot. Well, if you think about that in visual terms, that literally means the camera is going to be inside the bird or on top of it. And that's not quite what we want. We need the camera to be offset from the bird somewhat. So between here and here, we need some kind of mathematical offset. And we really only need it on the Y and maybe the X axis. So there's a way we can figure this out, and that's simply by looking at the position of these two things, because we sort of have guessed where the camera needs to be. We may need to fine tune it later. So if I look at my properties here, my bird is at this easy to remember position of 500, 500 on X, and the camera is offset from that by positive eight meters on X and minus 10 meters on Y. So I need to add eight and subtract 10. So what I'm talking about is three-dimensional position. It takes an X, Y, and Z value to communicate the position of an entity in a 3D game. And the set of nodes that deals with that sort of information is called VEC3, or three-dimensional vector. And I can either use add or I can use subtract. 
Obviously, they do the same thing only in inverse. I think in the book I used subtract, but it may be slightly simpler to use the add node. So I know from the position of the bird, I need to add 8 and subtract 10. So first I'm going to feed its position. If you roll over these nodes, you get a little tooltip that says the output is going to be A plus B. So I need to add 8 to X like this, and I need to subtract 10 from Y. So I'm going to make this a minus 10. And I'm going to feed that as the destination. So I've told it where to go, I've told it what to move, but I haven't actually told it how fast to go. Right now, I'm just going to do this in terms of time. I'm going to make it instantaneous. As soon as the bird moves, move the camera as well. The last thing I have to do is say when to start moving. And that means that I have to send a signal to this start input. So now is a good time to talk about why these inputs and outputs have different colors. What that refers to is the type of data that that particular node wants. And if you roll over this, the tooltip tells you green is any kind of data. That means any signal, as opposed to no signal, is good enough to start this node. If you look at this red one, red means integer. It only is interested in the integer value. There are strings, there are floating point numbers, and there's also VEC3, which is yellow, which is actually three floating point numbers. And the last one is Boolean, which is simply true-false. Although this is actually three different numbers, any signal will work because this is an any type node. The other important point I want to make about FlowGraph is one of the reasons it's so easy to use as a visual scripting language as opposed to writing code is that these data types are very forgiving. Essentially any data type can feed this even if it wasn't in any type. You don't have to worry about data type conversions between nodes. It just works. So where's the bird on every frame of the game? Offset it by this much. Move the camera to it. Here's what we're moving, where we're moving it to, and we're going to restart that movement every time we get a positional update from the bird, which is going to be every single frame of the game. So let's see if this works. We'll save F11, Control G, and I don't know if you can tell, if you look closely at the horizon line, we are falling, 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 and the camera's moving in such perfect synchronicity with the ball that it almost feels like it's not there. And as the ball continues to roll, we see our camera traveling with it. What happens when we jump? When I press the jump key, the camera moves up with it. As the bird arcs, hits its apogee, and starts to fall again, the camera follows it perfectly. Now there's only one thing that might not be immediately obvious until we really start to play the game, which is this question of whether we want the camera to follow this thing perfectly, instantaneously, or lag behind a little bit. The problem with instantly is every little jump that I do is going to restart a new movement with the camera. If I put a delay in, on the other hand, these little in-between movements aren't necessarily going to jostle the camera. The camera won't immediately respond to them. So I'm going to try something and introduce a little bit of a delay here, uh, four-tenths of a second. And if we go back and play again, you'll see that the ball maybe is too risky going out of frame sometimes, so that delay may be too long, or maybe that my jump is too dramatic. So keep this in mind. We'll fine-tune this later when we actually add our obstacles in the next chapter.